attracted adventurers and truth seekers. The first travelers started visiting Nepal after it opened its borders for tourism at the end of the 60s. This small mountainous kingdom welcomed them with the magic of rituals, the power of Buddhist holy places, and stories of enlightened masters who had reached perfection. It seemed like there was a secret behind every door, and one could meet great yogis even on the street. In 1968, the Danish couple Ole and Han and Dido came to Kathmandu having chosen the city as their honeymoon destination. They dreamed of finding a teacher. We met him in 68. We were in Nepal twice in 68. The first time we only heard about him. We were buying some different things, interesting Nepalese things like some Tibetan artifacts, uh, also a bit of hash, <coughs> which was legal there at that time, you know. Ole and Hanna belonged to the generation of European idealists who were discovering new levels of consciousness and shaking up social principles in the 60s. Ole's research work for his diploma in philosophy was devoted to the psychedelic aspects of the works of Aldous Huxley. We went there and we were at that time still, you can say like hippies, we were trying different things, psychedelics, but at the, on that day we had not taken anything and we were very sober. For many people, the most sacred place of Kathmandu is the Swayamhu Stupa. The Nepalese call it the Monkey Temple. Legend has it that many thousands of years ago, it appeared spontaneously on an island in the middle of a huge lake. The beneficial influence of stupas is immense. They bring peace and happiness to everyone who builds them, lives close to them, shows respect, walks around them, or meditates nearby. The shape of a stupa is rich in symbols, representing the structure of the universe and the qualities of mind. And we came to this woman again, um, the, the great uh, fine lady, you know, the Buddha Lakshmi Lama, was her name. And, uh, and she said, now my, my Lama is there. You know, Lopin Sechirim, which is uh, you can see him. Uh, 
And I remember we came in through the door there. There are always like fortresses, houses in that part of the world. There was a single pillar with a, with a flag, you know, a prayer flag, uh, which was there blowing good wishes into the wind. And then we got in there. Some people moved in and out, you know, in long uh, monk's robes and nun robes, they moved in and out. And we came, we came up to the second floor, and there we came in to the, we came up, and it was to our right, it was out towards the, the street again, that direction. And we saw his shoes being there, and we took off our shoes and we went in. And then he was sitting there. And he was just very kind, you know, very easy. He had heard about us, she had told about us, he was happy, we liked it, we liked Buddhism. I mean, very, very simple, very easy in the beginning and so on. And then I noticed something that was really funny, you know. When I looked at him, I, I discovered I could see the wallpaper behind him. And that's strange, you know, because he was a normal looking gentleman, but he was apparently transparent. <laughs> So I wanted to be sure that it was not hypnosis, so I took up a solid Danish mat matchbox. At that time I smoked a pipe, so I always had these matchboxes along in Danish. They were made of wood at that time, solid things. So I lifted this up and I held that against him. And now if this had been hypnosis, then also the matchbox would have been uh, transparent because he would have been doing something to my mind, right? And I looked and the matchbox was totally solid, right? And he was still transparent. And I said, that's way out, you know, I mean, that's too much. Then I checked it a couple of times. I looked to the side and once I looked to the side, he was, he was solid. But once I looked at him again, he was transparent once more. And then I just, I got so touched, you know, I said, man, man this, he's just, you know, he's something else. You know, I was really touched about it. Hannah was also deeply impressed and we somehow had the good idea to bow down our heads even though we had never tried anything like that before, we just bowed down and he put his hands on our heads. Then um, 
We woke uh, then, uh, we went back, I don't even know how we got back, we got a rickshaw, or walked parts of the way, we were like blown out, we saw all this clear light, you know, that he had put into us, we kept a tsh, it was there all the time, you know, we were like, probably like robots, zombies, we moved down there. Incredible dreams, you know, I mean really it was like somebody had just t taken our former life and, and shaken it, shaken it out on the, on the table in front and especially the not so good thing. a lot, I beat up a lot of people, I liked to go out and provoke fights in the bars at night and stuff like that. I did a lot of fighting and I always fought clean but I still hurt people, right? I never kicked anybody, I never hit anybody when they were weak, you know, or gave up or anything like that. But I still, you know, I did hurt a few. People looked like they'd been run over by a truck when I was through with them, right? So, you know, I mean, I, that was not nice to see again. just held our heads and we said, what was that, right? And then there were a couple of days where we had to digest that. It was the first time we looked inside and saw our own minds. It was the first time that really, you know, we, we discovered man, what we had been putting into our minds, you know, in all those years, you know, what, what kind of mixed stuff was there. Uh -huh. 